Welcome to Propy for Protection, brought to you by the Hemophilia Federation of America's Families Program. I'm Carrie Koenig, Families Program Coordinator at HFA. Also on the line, we have Lauren Nybert, HFA's Program Director, and Dr. Carrie Zella, Board Certified Pediatric Clinic Clinical Specialist, Physical Therapist at the Johns Hopkins Hemophilia Treatment Center. Just a few helpful hints before we get started. We have allotted approximately one hour for tonight's webinar. We certainly welcome your participation and questions. However, your audio will be muted for the duration of our webinar presentation by our system as it helps eliminate background noise. We do encourage your participation, and if you would like to ask a question, please utilize the chat tool on the bottom right of your control panel. We will then pass your questions on to our speaker. We will be answering all questions at the end of the presentation. We would like to take a moment to thank Genentech, Nova Nordisk, Bayer, Acredo, and the CDC Collaborative Partners for funding our Families Program. Without their generous donations, this webinar would not be possible. Tonight's presentation is Propy for Protection. We have an extremely knowledgeable speaker, Dr. Carrie Vella. Dr. Carrie Vel Dr. Vella excuse me, graduated from West Virginia University in 2007 with her Master's in Physical Therapy. She began working at Johns Hopkins Hospital in 2007 treating adult patients undergoing orthopedic surgery and kidney liver trans transplants. With a passion for working with children, Carrie transitioned to the Johns Hopkins Children's Center in 2008. From there, she continued her education at Drexel University, earning her post-professional doctorate of physical therapy degree with a special focus in pediatrics in 2011. In 2014, Carrie became a pediatric clinical specialist through the American Board of Physical Therapy Specialties. Carrie has been active in the hemophilia community since 2008, serving as a physical therapist in both the adult and pediatric hemophilia clinics at Johns Hopkins Hospital. We just want to remind everyone as well that this webinar is for educational purposes only and is not intended to be construed as medical advice or the official opinion position of HFA, its staff, or its board of directors. Attendees are strongly encouraged to discuss their own medical treatment with their healthcare providers. And with that, we can get started with our webinar. Dr. Vela, I'll let you take it from here. Good evening, everyone. Some of the objectives that we're going to go over tonight are recognizing and explaining what happens to a joint during a bleed, describing and understanding the risks of joint disease, explaining the process and benefits of prophylaxis, understanding that adhering to a prophylaxis is best for joint health, and explaining how to discuss prophylaxis and joint health with your children. First, we'll kind of review hemophilia and the def defect in clotting. Clot formation involves, among others, platelets and coagulation factors. The platelets are first to arrive at the scene and begin to loosely cover the injury. Thrombin enhances the activation and aggregation of platelets. On their surfaces, the coagulation factors, also activated by thrombin, accumulate. In tandem with 5A, factor 10A induces the so-called thrombin burst. Finally, thrombin converts fibrinogen into fibrin that then forms fibers cross-linked through the action of factor 13. This stabilizes the developing clot. In patients suffering from hemophilia, the propagation phase of clotting is disrupted. As a result, they cannot generate thrombin in sufficient amounts to induce normal clotting. The molecule is a B-domain deleted recombinant factor 8, its special feature, a purposely chosen polyethylene glycol polymer. This polyethylene glycol polymer, or PEG for short, is intended to prolong the circulatory half-life of the recombinant factor 8. In this way, reliable clotting could be restored. So common sites of bleeding, we have joint bleeds, which commonly occur in the elbows, knees, and ankles, and muscle bleeds that occur in the iliopsoas or your hip flexor, your gastrocnemius, or your calf muscle, and then in forearm muscles. 
So how do we detect a joint bleed? A lot of times we'll see acute pain, swelling, tenderness. It might be warm to the touch. There might be decreased mobility and range of motion. Or you might have sensation changes or tingling as another early sign, especially if you've had, um, you or your child has experienced a bleed before. And these signs and symptoms are due to intra-articular presence of blood, which is broken down and gradually resorbed by the synovial tissue. The joint should be able to recover its range of motion, muscle strength, and full function following a single bleed. However, the recurrent bleeds in the same joint lead to target joints, and this leads to the development of joint disease and long-term orthopedic complications, as we'll see kind of in this next slide. So repeated bleeding into the same joint instigates a vicious cycle, whereby the ability of the synovium to resorb blood in the joint is overwhelmed, leading to synovial perforation and inflammation, which results in joint synovitis or inflammation, and then more bleeding. This is what causes a target joint. The progression from a nor normal joint to synovitis and then to arthropathy is attributed to undefined mediators in the blood, which is not normally found in the joint space. Following a single joint bleed, the blood in the joint cavity is gradually resorbed by the synovial tissue over a period of three to four weeks, resulting in complete resolution of the blood. On the other hand, recurrent bleeding into a joint overwhelms the synovium. Iron then accumulates in the tissue, leading to a thickening that occurs of the synovium and the persistence of inflammatory cells. When hypertrophy of the synovium, or kind of a thickening of that, happens, it covers the joint, and this often alters the normal contour of the joint capsule. And this is what kind of leads to progressive joint damage. So as you can see here on the left, that's a normal knee joint, and the right is one that shows um, some arthropathy occurring in that joint. Prolonged exposure of cartilage to the joint in a target joint causes the cartilage damage, and bone remodeling occurs as the joint disease progresses. This is directly, directly linked to the frequency of bleeding episodes, in which turn is correlated with the age that the first joint bleed occurs. Hello, and welcome to this interact. Over time, the repeated bleeds cause chronic inflammation that has lasting complications on the joints. The accumulated waste and iron are toxic to the cartilage, bones, and synovium. As a result, the synovium thickens and grows tiny finger-like projections called microvilli. The synovium, with its small finger-like microvilli, are now more prone to getting pinched between the moving bones, resulting in a bleed. This early stage of joint damage where there is inflammation is called synovitis. As a result of this synovitis, the synovium no longer functions correctly. Thus, it is unable to lubricate the joint properly or remove the blood from the joint. Blood also has a toxic effect on the cartilage and prevents it from repairing itself. As this happens, the joint may form bony cysts with a loss of bone mass, leading to further pain and immobility. With repeated uncontrolled bleeds, there is more damage to the synovium and cartilage until the joint is unable to move. It resembles a crippling type of painful osteoarthritis, and the damage becomes permanent. So what we can look at is the what, what can we do? when this occurs, is we avoid weight bearing on the effective joint. We can look at compression and elevation of that joint. Ice, and this is strictly for pain management. And then physical therapy or supervised exercise after the pain and swelling subside. With this, we kind of get that musculoskeletal impairment. This can lead to ongoing muscle atrophy, osteoporosis, bone cysts, 
crippling arthritis, and this is the main cause of morbidity in these patients, and it affects the overall quality of life. More complications that can occur are loss of time from work or school, a decrease in the ability to play with friends, an overall decrease in activity level, so even kind of you know, walking around your house, psychosocial, and then emotional concerns as well. And these in turn lead to even more complications related to quality of life and the overall well-being of the individual. So we've discussed what happens to the structure of a joint when a recurrent bleed happens. Now we'll look at what does this mean or how do we fix it. There's conservative measures such as physical therapy to strengthen the surrounding muscles around that joint. We can look at orthotics or shoe inserts or different type of bracing, or we can look at different mobility aids such as crutches or a cane. There's also elective orthopedic surgery, which might be needed in order to control pain and preserve function. So we have this synoviothesis or an arthrocentesis, a major um, surgery might include a joint replacement, a synovectomy, an arthrodesis, or an osteotomy. And with these type of surgeries, what we're going to look at is a preoperative physical therapy, to, again, to strengthen those surrounding muscles, a preoperative evaluation, an intra and post-op bleeding plan, and then post-surgical rehabilitation. And these are all going to be in conjunction with your HTC. Ideally, we want to look at less bleeds occurring so we don't have to go through what we just talked, discussed through that surgery. Less bleeds will lead to norm, more normalized life, that of their peers. It can enable psychosocial development, promote physical activity, promotes regular school attendance, and again, overall better quality of life for the individual and their family. So how can we manage less bleeds and avoid surgery? And the answer is prophylaxis. And the, this is the first choice of treatment recommended by the World Health Organization and the World Federation of Hemophilia since 1994. And the main objective of prophylactic replacement treatment is to minimize the number of joint bleeds since an early age by converting a more severe form of hemophilia into a more mild form. There's primary and secondary prophylaxis. Primary will look at the continuous therapy starting after the first joint bleed, and this is usually initiated before three years old. And the main focus is on avoidance of any type of joint abnormality. Secondary prophylaxis is a continuous long-term treatment after two or more joint bleeds. And this is usually started after three years. This can be intermittent periodic prophylactic treatment, which might be used for short periods, especially to reduce the frequency of bleeds, in particular at target joints. And the main reason is to, again, avoid or delay the progression of that arthropathy. There's been several studies in hemophilia A that have shown that patients starting the first 20 exposures as prophylactic treatment compared, compared to an on-demand treatment due to a bleed have a decreased risk to develop inhibitors. And again, in hemophilia patients that have inhibitors, the role of prophylaxis, either primary or secondary, with bypassing agents and avoiding the development of arthropathy is not quite clear yet. So then we look at this prophylaxis triangle. And this is a treatment regimen that has three main determinants. The first is the given resources or the concentrate available, availability to target a specific trough level or the intervals of substitution, both with which reflect the cost. The second is the bleeding trigger, which looks at physical activity, the presence and degree of arthropathy, and the presence of chronic synovitis. 
And third is the number of bleeds, especially joint bleeds, that are regarded as acceptable. And as you can see, these three form a triangle. So if one determinant is changed, the other two will then adjust. So why prophylaxis? The development of hemophilic arthropathy is directly linked to the number of joint bleeding episodes. So there was a study among 378 patients enrolled in the landmark orthopedic outcome study, which was published in 1994. And they looked at the Peterson radiologic score, which is a measure of joint status. And this increased by one point for every 40 joint bleeds. There was another study of patients with severe hemophilia that found that just 13 bleeds were necessary to cause a one-point increase in this score. With children that had no obvious clinical signs of arthropathy, when they underwent MRI, there were early changes in the soft tissues, so the synovium and the cartilage, that were apparent, indicating that the emerging joint damage occurs after very few bleeding events. And arthropathy, once it's it's established, it's irreversible, and it's progressive. So prophylaxis is the cornerstone of the management for children with hemophilia. Again, looking at prophylaxis starting before or at the time of the second joint bleed, looking at between 6 to 30 months old, there was an 85% reduction in the risk of joint damage when compared to an on-demand treatment. There's also the reduction in the inhibitor risk. So there's a 70% reduction in the risk of children starting prophylaxis at around 35 months. And regular prophylaxis starting at the middle age of 20 months was an independent negative predictor associated with a 60% lower risk of inhibitor development when compared to an on-demand uh, treatment approach. So should you stop? A lot of times we think everything is going great and we can't, you know, should we continue to do this? And the reason that we, we would continue is there's this 66 Patients were evaluated at a median age of 32. 26 of them, percent of them, had stopped prophylaxis for a median of 10 years. And what they found was those that stopped, the objective assessment of joint status showed an increase in arthropathy after 10 years of an on demand treatment once they had stopped compared to those that continued. In addition, those that continued prophylaxis showed an improved physical functioning score. They showed an overall decrease in the bodily pain and an in improved social functioning score. So the answer is keep going. Just because things are going great doesn't mean we should stop and we should change. We should continue with that plan of care and continue with your prophylaxis. So how do we talk to your kids about starting prophylaxis or continuing to, with their current regimen? The importance of prevention, we want to make sure that we talk to them about preventing that joint arthropathy. We want to be able to, for them to recognize the sign of a bleed and to be able to act immediately, whether that's coming and talking to a family member, a teacher, um, the school nurse or if that's kind of infusing on independently. We want to talk to them about the ability to participate in activities that prophylaxis may allow them to do, which on demand may not. And this can kind of en enhance their feeling of inclusion with their peers. We want to talk to them about how to schedule prophylaxis. So is it going to be very disruptive in their current schedule with school and homework and family life and social life, um, and how do we adjust for that? And then finally, looking at adjusting their schedule 
of prophylaxis for their anticipated activity. So making sure we have it on days that will be most beneficial for them. So it's better to do it in the morning and then usually on the days that they're having higher activity or if they're doing sports. The half-life is also important to talk to your children about in order to understand, to recognize why a regular schedule is important. So this is the amount of time it takes for half of the infused factor level to disappear from your bloodstream. The half-life is typically 8 to 12 hours, and this means that in 8 to 12 hours, your body will have used up half of the factor that had been infused. So this is a really important thing to talk to your HTC about when you're looking at creating a schedule. So we always kind of use the example of it's easier to blow out a candle than it is to stop this raging forest fire. And this is the same when we look at your joint. It's easier to prevent something from occurring versus kind of once that damage is already done, it's hard to reverse it. And adherence is the key to ensure these full benefits. So greater adherence is associated with stronger beliefs in the necessity of prophylaxis. So they believe that prophylaxis is necessary as part of their treatment. It's also been shown that there's greater adherence with stronger emotional responses to hemophilia. So they might get more fearful, they might be more angry, um, more distressed. Those are all associated with having greater adherence to a prophylaxis, prophylaxis regimen. In addition, more positive outcome expectations more social support, whether that be family, friends, um, through their HTC, and then be overall being satisfied with the support that's being given. So you can feel that you're supporting your child or your loved one, but if they're not satisfied with the support, that might change how they're adhering to their program or to their regimen. Non-adherence, on the contrast, is linked to a lower belief in the necessity of prophylaxis in order to manage their hemophilia. There's lower necessity or concern. Lower prophylaxis-related self-efficacy. Less social support. And a stronger illness perception in relation to a timeline. So this is indicating that they believe the duration of hemophilia to be longer. For example, they have explicit recognition of it being a true lifelong condition. So there's also non-intentional non-adherence and intentional non-adherence. So when we look at non-intentional, this could be forgetting. You know, they get so wrapped up in their, their schedule. Or communication, so they might have flexible schedules and not communicating those changes um, with their HTC and flex flexible schedules with their um, infusions. There's greater concerns about prophylaxis were predictive of both skipping and forgetting, and this is likely to inc include concerns about the long-term effects of prophylaxis, the extent to which prophylaxis disrupts life, worries about not understanding treatment, or becoming too dependent on the prophylaxis itself. In addition to greater concerns, skipping was also associated with lower social support and interesting with greater coherence, and this is the overall understanding of hemophilia. Um, forgetting was associated with lower satisfaction with social support, lower positive out expectations and greater perceptions of treatment control. So it's unclear with 
and they looked at this study, why people who perceive themselves to have a better understanding of their hemophilia were also more likely to skip, and why people who have greater perceptions of treatment control are more likely to forget their prophylaxis. So how do we prevent non-adherence? What we can do is we can look at scheduling their prophylaxis into their day. So whether this be with breakfast, you know, as soon as you brush your teeth, you know, we do it. Um, scheduling it, again, on those activity or sports days. We can set up phone reminders. And this is the use. We can look at lots of different um, apps nowadays. Lots of kids have um, smartphones and cell phones that they can look at apps that they can track um, that can help set reminders for them. The first one is um, from Bears, Factor Track. And with this, you can customize infusion schedules based on the prescribed regimens from the HTC. We can record and track infusions, doses, lot numbers, as well as add notes related to bleed location or the changes in the dose. We can record and track bleeds based on the type, so whether it's a bruise, an intramuscular, um, and the location um, using an interactive body diagram. We can choose to be reminded when it's time for the next infusion um, for the prophylactic regimen. We can view and edit past, present, and future infusion records and bleed information in a calendar format, which you can see here. We can view and filter infusion history and bleed information and actually email that information to yourself or your healthcare team if you were to choose to do that. So you can have a very good direct communication. The next is Hemobile, which is by Pfizer. Um, and this is designed to help hemophilia patients and their caregivers um, log infusions, bleeds, and activity. So you, again, you can view your logging history and send the reports to your care team. Um, you can track your heart rate and your steps, distance, activity, when paired with a wearable device, which is pretty cool that you can kind of keep your activity log and you can see if it's related maybe to when a bleed occurred, that type of thing, um, which might be good for your therapist to know so that way they might be able to help you modify that activity if need be. And you can update and redesign report section to include um, new data measures and things like that that you can also share with your care team. My Factor is another um, app, and this is intended to help patients track personal infusion records, bleeding event history, and share important injury and treatment information with your healthcare team. And this app provides the ability for users to record, store, and view, and transmit medical information related to efficiency in the clotting factor. So again, this looks at tracking infusions, dosage, lot numbers. Um, it can track the bleeding events, including the type, the cause, the location. Um, it, it can include the pain level that you might have and the severity of that bleed. Um, it can capture photos, actually, to um, link with that bleed. So you can share those with your HTC. You can view and share reports of your infusion and bleed history. You can set up the reminders again for the prophylaxis. You can add notes related to any type of bleeding event or infusion that you would, might need to. And you can also set up multiple user accounts for one device. Microhealth hemophilia um, allows you to select your hemophilia treatment and receive personal um, reminders. Again, similar type of things. You can track your infusions, your bleeds, follow-up, pictures. Um, you can 
access your records. You can email a PDF, for, again, to send to your doctor, and they can see it online. You can scan the barcodes to log the lot number easily. Um, and this one, you, again, you can create the profiles to manage um, your children or your dependents. Um, You can invite your care team to share um, so that they can view to share your progress. This one you can order refills from your existing pharmacy. But the answer really is it's never too late to start prophylaxis. The earlier, although the earlier the prophylactic regimen is started, the better the benefits are regardless of the age of initiation. And again, the bottom line is it's never too late. Thank you, Carrie. Um, we do have a couple questions that have come in. So I'm going to go ahead and read those off for, the, for you. First one is, if a child's first joint bleed is before a year old, is it more likely that they will develop a target joint? So typically as soon as we start seeing multiple joint bleeds happen in the same joint, it will the likelihood of developing a, a target joint at that area is higher. Um, and usually we see the earlier bleeds um, that can again lead to the possibility of it leading to a target joint. That it's not a hundred percent, and that's why we kind of look at prophylaxis to try to help limit the amount that is actually occurring in the same joint. Great, thank you, Carrie. The attendees are, are starting to really use that chat box in the corner to ask their questions. I do have a question. Can you talk about the decision-making process of when to start Profi in a young child? So it's really going to be a conversation to have with your HTC. It's typically the earlier the better. So if we can, again, catch them before they a lot of the literature says around two years old, if we can kind of initiate before then, the, there's a better chance of not developing that joint arthropathy. But that's going to be an individual uh, conversation, you know, between yourself and your HTC. And again, depending on, you know, the severity of the hemophilia. Thanks. There is another question. As an HTC care provider, is there an app you find works best for patient and HTC? I haven't found one that I prefer significantly over the other. Um, there's little nuances that are from one that are more beneficial than the other. Um, I've used Factor Track with some patients, and I've, I've liked that one. I haven't had as much experience um, with the micro health. Um, so I, I think it's kind of a personal choice. Your HTC might have um, the doctor, you know, of your HTC might have much, a better um, one that they prefer to go to. Um, but I haven't found one that's, you know, you must use this one. <laughs> mm -hmm. it, is, it does take some, I have found personally that it takes some playing around with them and kind of finding what works best with you and your provider. Um, we have another question. So from a physical therapy perspective, is there anything you would recommend to do um, in order to prepare for that major surgery, that joint place, replacement? A lot of especially for a joint replacement specifically, um, looking at trying to strengthen the muscles surrounding the joint. Um, so if you're looking at a, a knee replacement, really strengthening that 
you know, your quad muscle or that muscle in the front of your thigh and your hamstring muscle. Those muscles kind of surrounding that joint because that's what we're going to need after that joint gets replaced to help stabilize and get that leg start moving again. Those are the, that's probably the big thing. Um, stretching is another good, um, you know, tool that we kind of look at. It's a little bit more limited, but because of the joint arthropathy that's there, that comes into play after that joint gets replaced. Thank you. Um, are you seeing more women with joint damage? Um, in our HTC, we don't see a lot of the, the women. Um, physical therapy is kind of a, um, people can, can elect to have that service or not. Um, so a lot of the women elect not to. Um, so I can't speak directly with that from experience. Um, usually, they're not definitely not as severe as um, the men. That's limited experience from, from that perspective, so I apologize. Okay. Oh, no worries. Thank you, Carrie. Um, how can we describe what a, a bleed feels like to our kids who haven't experienced one in, since they were babies? Like, is there a way to prepare them for that? A lot of kids have ex expressed that it almost feels like a bruise. Um, so you're getting, you know, that pain. You're getting where it's just really hard to move. Um, you can feel that it's kind of tender. It kind of hurts like you almost bang, you know, bumped it into something. Sometimes you can also, you know, if they've experienced any of that tingling kind of sensation. Um, but a lot of older children have been able to say it kind of feels like a bruise and then I feel like a lot of them once they've experienced one or two they kind of know you know that's what it feels like they've been able to, to decipher a joint bleed versus you know just a you know just a bump thank you in terms of like of target joints are you seeing any um, progress with any of the newer therapies? So I feel like the, the damage is definitely not as um, severe and there's a lot of, once it's developed into a target joint, kind of the surgical aspect has improved. So the success rate, I would say, kind of following has been has been good um, more recently than in the past, um, but it kind of depends on you know what else is going on as well. Um, how are those muscles doing kind of surrounding that joint? How tight are those muscles um, because of how bad you know that joint was beforehand? Yeah, it's a combined package. It's not Correct. just the joint. Correct. Right. You can fix, you know, take out the joint and replace it with something new, but that doesn't change kind of the surrounding structures as much, which is why we look at a lot of um, doing some therapy beforehand to help with that. Great. Thank you. Um, just a couple more. What age is best to start discussing half-life with your kids? Is there an age for that? I think the earlier the better. Um, once you know they're able to kind of understand the importance of prophylaxis, um, I think it's always better to initiate it as early as possible, and it might not be something that they understand right away, but that constant conversation um, is going to help with that adherence overall. Um, so I don't know that there's an, a, a too young, you know, a two-year-old, a three-year-old is probably too young, um, but you know, once you start getting into you know, five, six, seven, eight, I think definitely beginning those conversations is a good thing that they can kind of begin to understand. They might not get it fully, but continuing that conversation at each visit. 
Great, thank you. Um, are teenagers more likely to adhere to their treatment regimen if they are more independent in their bleeding disorder? That's a difficult question. <laughs> yes. I, I agree. I, I think... Go ahead. I, I think what the attendee is asking is, if you build the independence, are they more likely to adhere to, to their treatment regimen? So yeah. I think if they have, if they're, the teenager is able to understand the need for the prophylaxis, it's been shown that they do have better adherence. Um, if they have that social support for them to be independent with what they're doing, again, I think it's been shown that they there's better adherence from that perspective. Um, however, if you know that teenager is independent and they're kind of set off on their own, it's the research that's been out there has shown that that's not doesn't lead to a better adherence program. So as long as they have, I think, that support and that understanding, um, they should be do well with it. Great, thank you. Um, it doesn't look like we have any more questions coming in. So I'd like to thank you, Dr. Vela, for that very insightful presentation and thank all of you for your many questions that have come through this evening. Just as a reminder, it, this is for webinar is for educational purposes and is not to be intended or construed as medical advice. Um, also, the resources shared today are great tools for you to utilize and be sure to talk to your provider about what would work best for you. We have recorded this webinar and it will be available on HSA social media and web website within the next few days, so please check back with us. Uh, again, thanks so much, Dr. Vela, and I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.